like to take the opportunity to introduce Mick Devon. Mick is a state representative from Newcastle. He's also a marine biologist, if I can say that in this company. <laughs> <laughs> and he works at the Darling Center at the University of Maine on aquaculture. Um, he sponsored successful uh, bipartisan legislation on ocean acidification and uh, is the chairman of the Ocean Acidification Commission. He's graciously agreed <coughs> to share some of his Sunday with us and his insights. So, uh, so um, yeah, I'm uh, Mick Devon from Newcastle, and um, I represent most of the towns along the Damascotta River and Montehegan Island. Uh, one of my most dynamic uh, constituents is Andy Burke. <laughs> She's doing a lot of a lot of good stuff for the people in Maine, uh, and um, it's been it's been a pleasure to work with her as a constituent in the last couple of years. Damascotta River uh, in the Mid Coast area is one of the oldest um, places in the state in terms of median age. Um, you folks are also one of the oldest places. So when I stand up, I I often see um, people that are older than I am, and I'll be 52 next month. The average age in my district is 51. The average age in Maine is 43. And that's the oldest state in the union. So within, even within Maine, my, my district is very old. And I was so excited to see some young children come in here. Because <laughs> those are the people that, that we're really having these meetings about and who we're talking about. And we need to somehow engage the, the younger generation, the younger generation being teenagers and people in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Because as I look around, typically as I'm talking in Bristol, which has an average age of 54, or Noteborough, which has an average age of 51, I'm talking to people that are older than me. And as I look around, no offense, most of you people do look older than 51. <laughs> so we've got, to, we've got to somehow figure out how to get, get the younger folks involved. This is going to be a, a tough act to follow, um, and I normally talk, this talk normally lasts about an hour, and I'm going to try to cut it down to about 10 minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but ocean acidification, what does that mean? It means the ocean, which is, which is essentially basic, about 8.2, a pH of 8.2, is slowly dropping, and it's down around 8.1 or 8.08. People are going to say, well, that's not, that's not, it's not acid yet, it's still on the basic side. And my answer to that is when you go out in February and you put your hand in the water, it's cold. And then when you go in May, you put your hand back in or you put your toe in, it's gotten warmer, but it's still not, it's still not warm enough that you'll go swimming. It's still cold. So we're going, we're going through, we're going through a range, and this is having some, some significant impacts. And what's primarily driving this is the CO2 that man is putting in the atmosphere. And if you could go forward with that. Um, here we're looking at um, this, year zero. That's, that's when um, Christ was born. <laughs> and so the CO2 in the atmosphere was around 280 parts per million. And then we get into the mid-1800s, and suddenly it, it goes up dramatically. And what happened in the mid-1800s? Oh. We hit the industrial age and we started using fossil fuels. Next. So we're producing almost 10 billion tons, 10 billion tons of carbon per year that's going into the atmosphere as CO2. 45% of the atmosphere, 29% is being absorbed by vegetation, and about a quarter of it's going into the ocean. Next, please. So as we look at from the start of the industrial age, we look at CO, this is the rise of CO2 on this side, and the bottom is the sink. And you can see that, the, that land is absorbing at various stages, various amounts. But what's happened is that the atmosphere in the ocean is taking on a majority of it. And the land use, um, are, the way we are using land the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere has not really increased. It has to do with fossil fuels and cements. Next, please. 
That, or what this, if you go. Yep, go on back. All right, this is just showing you, this is just showing you as, as CO2 has gone up in the atmosphere, pH, pH in the oceans as it's measured has gone down. Next, please. Once again, I want you to look over at this, at this chart here. And we're looking at 20,000 years ago. CO2 kind of shot up. It went up slowly for about 19,000 years. And then, then it shot up. Once again, this is a fossil fuel we're putting in the atmosphere. Um, let's, <clears throat> this is a graph that's showing you that the CO2 that we put in the air um, is caused. Um, what, what's happening is that um, as we continue, if we continue on the rate we are, we're going to be putting CO2 in the atmosphere at the rate which is up in the red line. Um, if we cut down to back to the 280 that we were real slowly, it's still going to take about 100 years to get us back to where we were initially in 1850. So what this is saying in this chart, what this is saying is this blue line is, is if we cut back to 280 parts per million in terms of CO2 molecules in the atmosphere. And if we do that today, to get us back down to the CO2, the, the amount of CO2 we had in the atmosphere in 1850, just prior to industrial revolution, it's going to take us to about 100 years. So when you put the CO2 into the air and you put it into the water, it, it lasts a long time. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Next slide. I just, I can talk all night. I want to I wanna get through here quickly. Um, next slide. Um, this is what, what um, Peter and Brett were talking about in terms of, you know, you, you've got all sorts of things going on in the ocean. And so it's not just the Manhattan that we can be concerned about. It's not just the lobsters or their predators. In fact, one of the, another reason that the lobsters have done well that fo folks feel is not just because the predators have been taken away, but because the habitat's been changed. And how has the habitat changed over the last 25 years? Well, um, sea urchins became green gold, and suddenly we were fishing for those. And we were fishing for them at one point, 12 months a year. The roe is the only thing that is of value. They only have roe when they reproduce, which is in the fall into the wintertime. We were harvesting millions of pounds in June and July and August, which made absolutely zero sense. But anyways, you remove all the sea urchins, it changes, change the bottom. If we move on, please. This, what this is tells you is that the change in pH, and we can demonstrate that it's, that it's gone down over the last couple decades, but as we take readings, it changes. It changes through the, through the year. It's dependent on temperature. It's dependent on a whole slew of things. So it's, it's, once again, it's a very complicated environment that we're talking about. Next, please. Uh, we have another issue with ocean acidification in the coastal environments, and that's where we put in, um, we can put in all sorts of things that create ocean acidification through various ways. Next slide, please. Um, animals that produce shells are the, the animals that get impacted the most. And this little fellow right here is a pteropod. How many people have heard of a pteropod? Go ahead, don't be shy, raise your hand. So the vast majority of people haven't heard of a pteropod. Guess what, it's, they're the basis of the food chain in the ocean for a lot of animals. So if we destroy the pteropod, guess what's gonna happen? Everything beyond those in the, in the, um, in, in the food chain are gonna be impacted as well. So we've gotta be concerned about these little pteropods that, that few of us know about. Next. Here's something. This is a, this is a shell of a mollusk, it's a simple clam. And if you're looking at 15, par excuse me, you're looking at 390 parts per million CO2, you get a shell that's about this thick. If you double that to about 750, the shell is thinner. If you then double it to 1,500, 
it's even thinner. So we're stressing these, these animals out. Now, what's not on here is somebody said, you know what, let's go back to that 280. So they did the experiment at 280 parts per million and the shell was even thicker. So what we've done in the last, in the last um, few decades is we've stressed our, our shellfish out. And although we're talking a lot, to, we're talking a lot, the focus of the conversation seemed to be on lobsters today, there are a lot of, there are a lot of fishermen that, that, make, that make their living off of, off of harvesting um, clams. Next, please. Um, next, please. Next, please. Yeah, this is a, the final, um, this is the final slide I want to talk about. These are uh, two types of lo lobsters, um, actually three species of lobsters and two species of crabs. And you look at the various type, um, re uh, times of their life history, embryos, larvae, juveniles, and adults. And so you've got all these boxes. And where there is a box, there's actually been a study that's demonstrated, that's looked at ocean acidification. The big point here, the take home message is that most of the boxes are empty. Mm -hmm. We don't know what we're doing with how we're impacting our environment with this lowering of the pH. We've seen some of the initial problems. We've seen shellfish issues in Casco Bay, in the Damascotta River, where there's, a, where there's an oyster hatchery. They're, they're having problems. I've seen some problems in the hatchery that I run in the Darling Center. So we're starting to see those problems, but we don't know in general what's going to happen because we haven't, we, have, we haven't studied it enough. And I think with that, we'll finish up. That was the science side. Ocean Acidification Commission that was established, I put in a bill in the second session. When you put a bill in in the second session, it has to go through the Legislative Council. The Legislative Council consists of the five legislative leaders in the Senate and the five legislative leaders in the House. You need six people to, you need six of the legislative leaders to say, this bill is important <laughs> enough to go through the second session of the legislature. If you heard a lot about ocean acidification recently, it's, a, it's about the biggest topic environmental topic that we have on the, on the coast right now. The legislature as a whole is talking about it as much as any, it's probably the number one environmental issue. Well, when I first put the bill in last, um, last September, three of the 10 leaders said this bill was worthy of going through. So then I appealed that and I got over 100 fishermen and scientists and marine stakeholders from Kittery to Eastport to contact the, the legislative leaders. And we got up to seven. So we needed six. We squeaked by with seven. Ultimately, as the bill went through the legislature and, and legislators were educated, every, every senator voted for it, all 35. And then all of the representatives um, in the House, except for five. <coughs> and that's about as good as you're going to get, because there are a few legislators who are libertarians and don't believe that the, that, the, that the state government should be involved in any sort of studies. So when you get up to 145 or 146 out of 151, you're doing about as, as good as you can. <coughs> the take home message here, though, is that this Ocean Acidification Commission, which has been established, in which we hopefully will be able to learn a little bit about ocean acidification, determine what those impacts will be in the future, or, or predict what those will be, and then predict, follow on to that, what the, mini, what the mitigating marine policy is that could be developed. That bill almost didn't go through. And so we really, have got to, we've got to be very careful in terms of when we move forward on an environmental bill that we fight very hard right from the very beginning or that, that bill might not see the light of day. And ocean acidification is quite important because it's directly tied to global change and, I mean, climate change and global warming. 
And if I had labeled the bill as global warming or climate change, there's no way it would have ever gone through. And so the bill was focused and, and remains focused on ocean acidification. But it's the first, it is the first bill here on the east coast of the United States that's looking at ocean acidification and leading the way in terms of looking at anthropogenic CO2. I mean, the, the amount of CO2 that we're putting in the atmosphere now, as opposed to a decade ago, when we supposedly started trying to cut back, is, is much greater. And so we've got, we've, got to keep, we've got to keep educating people and working towards a way so that we can understand what Peter and Brett were talking about, and that is an extremely complex environment. And when you make one change, you end up impacting three things. And with that